All right, what a series, Reset. And man, have we needed a reset. And I trust that so far all these messages have been good for you. The book of 1 Corinthians is so helpful. It stood out to me when I was a young Christian and, and produced major changes in my life. And so I, I trust that it's doing the same for you even now as it continues to speak to me as we bring these messages. Well, today we're, we're going to be talking about marriage. I mentioned that in the intro, and uh, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the passage we're going to look at. But when we're talking about marriage, uh, that might turn some of you off. And maybe some of you are thinking, I don't know if I really want to listen to this because I'm not married. Or it could be that your marriage is in such a place where it's just really discouraging and you feel like this isn't for you. And I, I want you to hold on. Stay in there because for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, if you're single and you're not married... I want you to know that a big part of this, of 1 Corinthians 7, is for singles. So we're not just talking to married people. We're going to be talking to singles today, and I think this is going to be beneficial for you. But the other part of it is that all of us should be familiar with what the Bible says about any situation that we may be in life, and including married. If you're single, you should still know what the Bible says about marriage. Just like you may not be an elder. I'm an elder, but you may not be an elder in the church, but we should still know what the qualifications are for elders because holding them accountable to that and knowing who to choose for our elders, that's a big deal. So all of us should understand what the Bible says about marriage. So let's, let's hang in there. But as I said as well, uh, and some of you, by the way, some of you singles will get married, and so you want to hear this. But a lot of this is for singles as well, so I, I think this is going to be, be beneficial for all of us. So the passage we're looking at, 1 Corinthians 7, if you want to grab your Bibles, wherever they're at, and take a look at this, we're going to go verse by verse. We're going to jump over a, a bunch of it and just explain what, what sections of this are talking about because it's a, it's a big book. And, uh, and then I'm going to bring my wife in at the end of the message, and we're going to get real practical. So let's, let's get into this with prayer. Father, thank you so much for giving to us your word. We thank you that it is practical, that it speaks to us where we are at, whether we're single or, or married. And I pray that you would, that your Holy Spirit would do the work on the inside as we are reading your word and understanding what it says, that the biggest thing that would take place would be change in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you were writing a letter to a church where you knew that their idea of marriage and their practice of marriage was just all jacked up, was just messed up, that they came from really bad backgrounds and they were surrounded by people that were living in all kinds of immorality. They had lived that way in the past and, and now we're even struggling in coming out of that. And, and if now you're writing to this church here in Corinth, you're writing to them and you've only got 700 words. That's the gist of 1 Corinthians 7, less than 700 Greek words here. That's all you've got, and you want to say something that is significant enough to give them real help in their broken relationships. What would you say? Well, that's actually what the Apostle Paul was up against when he was writing this, because he was writing to a group of people who not only did they came out of a messy background, but there was all kinds of bad teaching regarding marriage that was going on in the church, and, and he's trying to address this, and at the same time knowing that they were struggling in their relationships, and there's a lot at stake here because these people were raising kids as well. And so what is he going to say to this people in such a way that it's going to help them? And I'll tell you what we're going to find is there's two principles that we're going to pull from this passage when we're done that made all the difference in the world for my wife and I when we walked into our marriage Maybe not in the same situation with a messed up background, but not having a clue as to how to do it well. So let's get into the scriptures right here. Beginning in, in verse 1 of chapter 7, Paul says, Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. I actually said to one of my friends right, right before I came on here, the trouble with this verse here is I read that little phrase there, and I think, I, I don't agree with that. <laughs> I, I, I'm not necessarily, I don't know if I like this. What's Paul actually saying? Uh, well, first of all, we have to understand what sexual relations mean here. If you read this in other versions, that it translates it in a number of different ways. In the NIV, it says married. It's good for a man not to be married to a woman or to be married. And uh, I, that's certainly not true biblically with the rest of Scripture. And others, uh, in the Old King James as well as the New King James, it says it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And, and actually, there's, it's not all that far off. I think that the King James is probably a little closer, maybe even than the ESV, because the, the word here is op testi, and op testi does mean to touch, but in, it also means to ignite. It means to touch in a passionate way, or in a way that ignites the hormones of, of the woman as well as yourself. So we call this a kind of a passionate sexual kind of a touch. 
And he says, that, that shouldn't be going on. This stuff, the, the, that kind of touching shouldn't be going on. The other thing I want you to notice, which is important to understand this verse, is these quotation marks. See the quotation marks uh, before the it and after a woman? The reason it's in quotations in the English is because what Paul is doing here, he's responding to questions that he had gotten from the Corinthians. You can see that from the beginning, not concerning the matters about which he wrote. This is something that they had written to him, and so he is responding to this. And so he, here's his response. He says, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. All right, so here we have, uh, um, again, each, woman sh each man should have his own wife, each woman should have her own husband because of the, the, the temptation. Now, what's going on here is we had just gotten done talking about sex in the, in the chapter before, in fact, last week. And Paul is trying to clarify that it's also okay to be celibate. Now, he's not requiring it. In fact, he's, he's, uh, he's not saying that it's better than being married. Now, he did say that if you're not celibate, then you need to be married because the only person that biblically that we are, we are allowed to have sex with is our spouses. But he's saying it's also okay to not be married, to be celibate. And that's, that's good, too. Singleness is good, too. And, uh, and then in verse 2, he acknowledges that temptation is strong. So he says each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. The word have here, have is not get. He's not telling single people to, okay, go get a husband or go get a wife because, uh, so that you're not tempted. No, the word have is, means sexually have or to be intimate with. Let each man be intimate with his wife and be fulfilled with his wife and each woman be fulfilled with her husband so they're not tempted outside of their marriage. That's actually what he is saying. In fact, take a look at the next couple of verses. This all fits right in context. He takes it a step further. He says, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights. In the ESV, I, I get a kick out of the way they put it here, but uh, her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her, her husband. And uh, conjugal rights, I, that's not how we normally talk, but the Greek word, and it's just one word, aphilane, and it means what is due. So again, he's saying, this is, this is due her. Husbands should give to their wives intimacy because you owe it to them and you made that promise when you got married. In the same way with wives, wives are to give their husbands intimacy because this is what you owe them. This is what is due. Now, look at as he takes this even further. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. It's like, whoa. I mean, if that doesn't sound sexist. In fact, is, is he approving of marital rape? Well, no, of course not. In fact, it's not sexist at all. If you read the rest of the verse, because he, he not only says the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband. He says, likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Now, this, by the way, this is revolutionary in the Roman world. And because even among the Jews, and the Jews were more pro-women than the, any of the Gentiles were in this part of the world. Romans, Romans viewed their wives almost as property. But, but and Jews were certainly better than that. But nobody had this new Christian ethic that Paul was proposing. And what he is saying is that there is this mutual submission that you are to give to one another that both of you have to understand. This is for both of you. This is the co-equal obligation that you have to one another. And, uh, and by the way, this thought could be revolutionary to you in your marriages as well if you see intimacy this way. I like the way the NLT, the New Living Translation, kind of softens this, but I think it also helps us give an understanding more of what he's talking about. Here in the NLT, Paul says, the wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. And the point is, when you stood at the altar, or when you stand at the altar, you are giving yourself, your heart, your mind, and body to your wife, to your husband. Being one flesh now, you are no longer to think in terms of what you want or what your rights are. You are to enter into this profound new state of mutual marital submission. And sex is a big part of that. You don't have sex just because you feel like it. You want it. You got to have it. That's what the animals do. Instead, you give of yourself to your spouse in unselfishness. And then he says in verse 5, do not deprive one another. Actually, all the English versions that I looked up use the same word. Even when I looked up the Greek word behind this, they only gave one word. Usually there's a whole paragraph to explain the meaning of this word. It only gave one word, which is deprive. That's what it means. To hold back what is due. 
So Paul says, don't hold back from your husband, don't hold back from your wife uh, what is due. Um, ex- except by agreement, unless you are agreeing to this. And then even if you agree that there's going to be a time when you're not going to be intimate, it, it should be a limited time, he says. And that may be for spiritual reasons, like, like fasting. You may give up food for a time for fasting and praying. But when you give up food for a time, it's for a limited amount of time or you'd starve. And he's saying in the same way when it comes to your relationship as husband and wife and that intimacy that you may agree to, 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 to hold back for a time, but it needs to be a limited time to devote yourself to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And so he's saying, man, this, this, we, we got to be careful here. Don't ever think you have enough self-control to handle sem- Satan's temptations when you're in a weak state. And don't put your spouse on such a pedestal as to think that they would never be tempted to cheat. Because none of us are that strong to handle Satan's temptations, especially when we are weak. We are all made out of the same stuff. Don't put your spouse in an unnecessary place of temptation by weakening them by holding back affection. That's what Paul is saying. And remember what we learned last week, which is, true biblically and supported by science it's not just that good marriages have better intimacy more physical intimacy in marriage is a big part of making a better marriage and once again if you didn't get last week's message download it listen to it watch it it continues in verses six and seven he says now as a concession not a command i say this i wish that all were as i myself am now what is he talking about well, Paul was single. He wasn't married. And, uh, and actually, most Bible scholars, uh, and I, I looked this up in a number of sources, most agree that Paul, being a rabbi and a Pharisee, it's doubtful that he had never been married because it was required among the Jews that rabbis be married. It was also required that Pharisees be married. And he was both. And so he, he had been married at some point. We don't know if his wife had passed away. Some have speculated because of what he writes in Philippians 3 about having given up all things because of Christ that it could be that when he was converted that his wife was, was just, she couldn't handle it and, and left him. We don't know. He doesn't say. But I think this should really ser- serve as a shout out to all of our singles. Paul saw singleness actually even at this point as the preferred status. In verse 26, if you look forward into verse 26, he says because of this present distress and and we think what was going on there is that there had been a persecution in northern Greece that was now moving its way down into southern Greece, and they were about to face some heavy persecution. And so he was saying that during this time, it's tough to have a wife or a husband and responsibility and kids, and so it's probably preferred that you remain single. But, but to me, what this shouts is that it is honorable to live as a single person for God's glory. Jesus himself was never married. Many good, wonderful, godly people have never been married or or they've lived single and for much of their lives. People that I look up to and love dearly, some of the most wonderful, godly, and kingdom impacting people I know are singles. And some of the most important people in our church are singles. It is a it is something to embrace. Beginning in uh, verse and then uh, he, he finishes then in verse 7. He says, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. He says, but, you know, it's, this isn't for everybody. Some have the gift to be able to remain single, and some are not able to remain single. And, and he, he gets this. Of course, Jesus had referred to the same thing. about the, It's a gift to be able to be single. And uh, verse, eight, verse 8 and 9, he says, now, to the unmarried and the window, widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. How often do you hear this? It's good to be single. And in so many circles that you go in, it's viewed as almost a curse. And I feel, I so feel for our single people that, that, that themselves, they feel out of place in a lot of situations because they're not there as a couple. And Paul's saying, no, this, this is good. There's a lot of good aspects of being single. And he continues, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they don't have that gift, they should marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. So it's better to marry than if you got this overwhelming temptation and you need to be with a woman or need to be with a man for that reason. And so Paul says, if you've been given this gift of singleness, then that's great. But if you haven't and you marry a person, 
uh, that's also committed to following Jesus. And by that, that's a caveat later on that, that he gives in verse 39, that only in the Lord. That if you do marry, it should only be in the Lord, meaning you should only marry someone who is committed to following Christ, who is also a Christian and to putting God first and according to God's leading. So he says that this certainly is not wrong. But then he speaks to married people. We get into verse 10. He says to the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. And when he says not I, but the Lord, he means that uh, he's not saying that the Lord is giving him special inspiration beyond other things in this. He was just saying, I, Jesus said this. When Jesus was alive, we, I could quote him on this because Jesus said this. He says, I give this charge. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. Pretty clear what he's saying. He's saying you, you should not divorce. If you're married, stay married. Pour yourself into that marriage. Embrace your marriage. It sounds like there was a lot of divorce that was actually going on in the Corinthian church, and he's, he's trying to straighten this out. And so he's saying um, you should not separate. Um, we continue on. He says, to the, to the married, I give this charge, not I. Oh, he, actually, he gives, what, he, what he gives here is, he says, you have two options if you do. But if she does, if she does separate, if, he does, she, if she does, or he does divorce, then she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. Now, he doesn't tell us what to do in a case where the ex is unwilling to be reconciled or it's impossible to reconcile because that person's already been remarried and we have other scriptures to look at for that. That's why we, we often will help, you know, hope to get counselors involved in those situations. But the point that he's trying to make here is do not seek to separate or get a divorce. And separate and divorce were the same thing in the, in the Greek language and, and in the Roman world. And so now he continues um, and uh, says, to the rest I say, not the, I, not the Lord. Now when he says not the Lord, he's not saying God isn't speaking to me about this. He's not undermining his apostolic authority or the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's just saying, I don't have, Jesus didn't say anything about this, so I don't have him to quote on this. He says, to the rest I say, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever. So if you're married to someone who's not a Christian, what do you do about that? He says, and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever, and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. So if you are married, now, if you're not married, you should not marry an unbeliever. But if you are married to an unbeliever, he says, stay with them. Stay with that person. Now, he's not telling you to put up with adultery or physical abuse. But he is saying that you might have to endure a difficult marriage for the sake of the gospel. And there's something we have to bear in mind when it comes to, and I feel for, for some, and I, you know, and I wish I could spend more time talking about this part of it, because there are some that you're just really struggling in your marriage right now. And even hearing this is like a wound to you, like, wow, I, I feel hopeless in my marriage. And no, he hasn't cheated on me, or no, you know, she hasn't uh, left me, but man, it just feels hopeless, and this, this person's not a believer. Something to remember is that we, a lot of Christians are in a variety of difficult situations that they can't get out of. Physical disabilities, financial collapses, and, and they can't just divorce their way out of those difficulties. There are times when we are in the middle of something that may even feel overwhelmingly difficult. And I know, and it may be easy for me to say this, but I do know what that's like. I went through some intense rejection as a young man and even early in my Christian life. Man, I, I, I was homeless. I knew what it was like to go through some real difficulty. And some of our Christian brothers and sisters are in the middle of just horrendous situations and they can't just divorce their way out of these situations. And so how do we counsel them? How do we love them? What do we tell them? What we do, we, we put our arms around them and, and try to help them, but, we, but we, we help them to see that, man, sometimes we have to go through the fire and it's God's way of lovingly refining us. And it may be that you are in a tough or a difficult marriage, and it's not that he wants you to feel trapped, but he does want you to know that in the middle of this, this may be just his way of refining you and giving you a unique and wonderful way to bring honor and glory to God in a way that other people will not be able to. So the above verses, uh, verse 15 says, well, of course, if you have an unbelieving spouse who chooses not to stay with you, if they leave, you're not obligated. You're even free to remarry, which is what it means to not, not, to, um, uh, to not be enslaved by them. But he says, who knows? I mean, who knows whether or not 
you will be able to save your husband or, or who knows husband, whether or not you'll be able to save your wife, that God wants to be instrumental in bringing that person to Christ. And so this is so important that we see this as an opportunity. God wants to use you. If you're married to a non-Christian, he wants to use you as the bridge between he and, that, and, and your spouse. And yes, that is where we got the name of our church. God wants to use you in a special way. And so if you focus on not, not may, just honoring God in every way that you possibly can, even in the middle of that difficult marriage. Well, as I had mentioned, in, in verse 15, he does say that if the unbelieving partner de- departs, there's nothing you can do about that. You're not under bondage in that situation. And then verses 17 through 24, this next paragraph, he goes on this whole treatise on, on making the best of whatever situation you find yourself in. Because so many Christians... They, they want to just, any time they're in a bad situation, they want to change their circumstances. And so we see people that are making all kinds of changes. To They think they're going to better their life by switching jobs or buying a different house or moving out of state and, and always wanting to make changes. And Paul essentially is saying, you know, you know what, you, you can make the best of the situation you're in. In fact, he even goes into a, a curious example here when he talks about slavery. And uh, this could... This could ruffle some feathers here, but you have to understand that the slavery that he's speaking of in Rome was very different from the slavery that we think of in the Deep South in America as well as in Europe uh, with the African slave trade when these, these people are dehumanized and it was an awful situation. And, and even slavery in Rome, in, a certain, in Rome was not a good thing, but over half of the population of the Roman population were enslaved. And it was different in that they, they were more indentured servants than anything else they were paid for what they did but they were obligated to continue working for whoever their employer was for the rest of their lives and so in that sense they were slaves but it was a different kind of a slavery but even there it was not best and paul does he paul tells them if you can if you can get your freedom get your freedom if you can better your situation of course better your situation but for so many of us we're just always craving to change our circumstances rather than making the best uh, whatever the cir- circumstances that we are in. And this is good wisdom for all of us. This can be helpful for all of us. And in reality, this fits right in with the discussion that Paul is having on marriage, which he then returns to in the closing paragraphs of the chapter. In those closing paragraphs, he tells unmarried people to make the most of their singleness and don't crave marriage. And then he tells marrieds to stay married and make the most of their marriage. Paul really believes that happiness and fruitfulness has little to do with our circumstances and everything to do with our approach and focus on honoring God with whatever the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Well, there's a lot in this chapter. There really is. But I, what I want to do is I want to bring this home and, and uh, bring this down to where the rubber meets the road. And, and, and to do that, I'm going to invite my wife to come and participate with me and and we're going to make just some practical application from the principles that we find in this chapter. Well, Linda, thank you for joining us here. And if you don't know my wife, Linda, she's been my wife for 36 years, and I appreciate you coming. She doesn't like to be in the spotlight, but I'm really glad when she is because she does a nice job with it. And, and your hair looks great. I know you had a hair thank appointment you. earlier today. Thank you. What yeah. did they do exactly? They, a lot of improvements, but um, that's all you need to know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I am kind of amazed at how you, your hair is the same color it was when I first met yeah. you. And my, yeah. you know, I got all this gray coming in, but not, not yeah, you well, for uh, some reason. No. Well, actually, a lot of couples ask me, that they, they'd say, you know, I'm surprised you don't have more gray hair than you do. And we won't talk about why that is. Yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> well, listen, we wanna, what we want to do now is just to give some real practical uh, advice from scriptures. And we've been through a lot here. First Corinthians 7, there's a lot of stuff in here. Let's, let's get into what, how can we boil this down into what we can take home and how we can practice this for both singles and marrieds. And for starters, for singles, I think what, what just screams loud and clear from everything that Paul is saying and throughout this chapter, he always, Paul makes everything spiritual. He brings everything back to God. And so uh, we can't get away from this. For singles, if you want to make the most of being single, you've got to put God first. Well, Scott, when you say putting God first, what does that actually look like in everyday life? Because we, we, can, we say that a lot, but what does it look like? Yeah, practically, what does that actually mean? Well, from the chapter here, of course, uh, for starters, it it means not giving in to the sexual temptations around us and being committed to sexual purity. That, 
you just absolutely committed to I mean, with singleness of course there comes some added temptations but you're you're just committed to this i'm going to do what is going to be pleasing to god and not just what is going to allow for me to fit in with other people or bring pleasure to myself now, now it sounds like there's a lot of don'ts but actually with this this chapter there's a lot of do's as well yeah because i think that for a single person to be able to exude god being first in their life and everything that they're doing when they're with their friends being a witness and a testimony mm -hmm. always be thinking how can i represent jesus mm -hmm. that's a big deal then uh, secondly uh, linda what's the what's the, the second, second is embracing your singleness because actually the chapter talks about singleness as a gift yeah and i'm um, celebrating that and in a lot and, of circles and, we talked about this mm -hmm. in the message a lot of circles it's not viewed that way but look for the benefits of being single and celebrate those benefits and and you may want to get married someday which is okay it's, it's okay to want to get married someday but but you may not also and if you do get married someday you're going to look back on these years and hope and, and wish that you would have used these to their max and use these in a way that that you embrace you've them. often said scott that you you can't be happy married if you're not happy single that's exactly right in fact uh, uh, if you take uh, an unhappy person and marry them to a happy person, you wind up with two unhappy people. Being unhappily single just equals two unhappily married people. And so being happy today is important. So enjoy this time. And, but, but make your time all about serving God. I, our daughter Erica, I, I've got to hand it to her. During the, her single years, I mean, she mm -hmm. really did. She embraced it and made the most of it. And she wanted she to get did. married. She longed to get married. Mm -hmm. But she traveled, traveled actually uh, around the world mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. saved up her money and and she poured did. herself into serving. She, she, she did. She she was in. I think she had. I think she was serving in like four different places at four one time. Four different ministries in the church. Just because she was she was able. She was single and she poured herself into it. And I, 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 and I think another great uh, thought of this is that if you're single and you have these opportunities to be able to serve in ways that married people, people with families are not, not able to, what about just making yourself available to people who need you in a special way? Like, guys, when we get one of those big snowstorms, why not get up early and get out there? There's a lot of people out there that could really use your help just shoveling their walk and clearing out their driveway. Why not just get out there and do something for some people who need you or or perhaps making yourself available for child care guys and girls for for those that at one time they were single now they find themselves uh, up to their neck and kids and they just have ver barely enough time to breathe they could use you to help out with some child care so why not make yourself available to that it's got um years ago uh if i there was a friend of mine katie yeah. let me just kind of tell you a little bit about katie katie was a single woman who i believe i mean long to get married yeah and on Friday and Saturday nights, when everybody was going out, Katie did something a little different. She decided that she would actually open her home to junior high girls, girls that were kind of in that awkward stage, a little, um, you know, it was a tough age. She would open her home and just have them come over, and she would just enjoy them for the evening, play a game with them, pop some popcorn. In fact, you see her right here. That's she, her right there. She, she would always invite one of her friends. That's her yep. friend, Renee. And then, and if you recognize these two girls, that's actually Maddie, who, who is our Bridge Kids director today, and Erica, our daughter, both of them godly women, and she chose to use her single years to pour mm -hmm. ourselves into the lives of these young girls. I, she actually wound up getting married. I think it was the she last did. wedding I did before I left she Wisconsin. Did. Yes. Yep. and uh, is enjoying mm -hmm. her married life now but made the most of her singleness she did well we have to talk to the marrieds as well right because uh has, actually this was called resetting your marriage but again and and I, a good way to start off here linda's we've talked about this when we do the marriage mm -hmm. series you and i we we had we just didn't have much to go on when we got married mm -hmm. we had no pre-marriage counseling we wish we would have but we didn't uh, we, we didn't come out of a background where we had the uh, models to follow and we didn't right. know people. I came from a really tough situation and my mm -hmm. parents had a really bad marriage. Not, not so much with your parents. Your parents had a good marriage. Mm -hmm. but we just didn't have any teaching. We didn't have a foundation right. And, right. And, and we, we didn't have a clue. Right. And we did. We, we struggled. Married. We struggled. There were some years we struggled. We didn't do everything right. We had, we had to, uh, you know, work on it. But there were two things. And mm -hmm. I've always said this. There are two things that enabled us to put together 36, well, maybe 30 really good years, but <laughs> 36 good years, and hopefully we have many more mm -hmm. to come. Two things that we had going for us, and the first one fits right with what we said to the singles. 
and that is both of us were committed to putting God mm -hmm. first in our lives. We, we really right. truly wanted to honor mm -hmm. God with our lives. But here again, uh, putting God first, how does that, what does that look like in marriage? Yes, uh, well, I think first and foremost is with our words. And words the truth are is, big. Words are huge. Uh, we, we didn't really do that in, in all aspects of our marriage. We mm -hmm. wanted to, but we didn't. We had to learn some of these things. Mm -hmm. but, but I think first of all, it's, it's mainly in our words. When I do weddings, and uh, you, you've been to how many of my own? It's probably over 100. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I've done uh, at least 100, maybe a couple hundred. Uh, and I, I say almost the same thing every time because I know that the couple that I'm doing a wedding for, they're, they're not listening to a whole lot that I'm going to say. So I just want to give them one thing that's powerful. And so I think about these Corinthians. The one thing that Paul is trying to get them to, to listen to, actually two things that he tells them. And, uh, and I say, so I say the same thing almost every time. And uh, it, it actually goes back to what Paul said to the Ephesians about marriage. But I say this, if you, every time you open your mouth, I look at the wife, every time you open your mouth and you are talking to your husband, if you are saying words that are pleasing to Jesus, not your husband, but if you are saying words with a tone that Jesus will be pleased with, you're going to have a good marriage. Mm -hmm. And I look at the husband and I say the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and likewise, as, as a wife, if I am not showing, um, if I'm not submitting and showing respect, encouraging you to lead, and, and you, my, that's actually some, I'm stubborn, so that's, <laughs> that, it's tough for me sometimes, but if I'm not doing that, then I'm not showing um, respect, and I'm not, I'm not taking God seriously if I'm not doing that. You, you can't be, because it's, it's what the Bible mm -hmm. teaches in the same way. If I'm not doing what Peter said, to, to live with your wives with understanding and just learning all about my wife, and then and, and then loving her and striving to love her as Christ loved the church, then I can't be putting God first. See, a lot of us, what we do is we try to make it about the marriage. We talk about, well, my marriage is bad. It's not the marriage. It's the people in the marriage. We want to say, well, like, like, it's, a, like it's a piece of luggage or you know, it's something outside of me that, well, I'm struggling with my marriage, but everything else is great. No, it, it's, it's all about the relationship. It's me. It's, it's my sin. It's not the marriage that's bad. It's my sinfulness that's hurting the relationship. And so putting God first for me has got to be focusing on doing all that I can to love my wife as Christ loved the church and learning everything I can about her so that I know how I can love her in a way that really is meaningful. Well, and, and too, praying together. Yeah. Praying together is, is a huge thing in a couple's life because that brings you together we mentored one couple where they had never prayed together ever mm -hmm. in their life up mm -hmm. until the time when they started meeting with us and, and and their marriage was it was struggling mm -hmm. and the one thing that they took away from this uh, was that they began praying together in fact it was almost a year later the husband said to me i want you to know this scott there has not been a day since we first started meeting with you that we have not prayed together not a single day it revolutionized mm -hmm. their life together that spiritual component, putting God at the center, makes all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. Put God first. Mm -hmm. I think about just, actually the other day, it was a couple days ago, mm -hmm. you head off work. Usually Lydia gets off real early. She's gone real early. But you head off work that day. We still got up early, and, mm -hmm. and, then, and I get up early anyway. And I got up, and I was having my quiet time. And, and then you came in and sat down on the couch across from me, and you, you pulled up the church app and then did your mm -hmm. reading. And Mm -hmm. And we sat there and talked after doing our quiet time together. There was just something very special and I think yeah. powerful as, as we have that third strand, as it says in Ecclesiastes, mm -hmm. the cord of three strands, that third st strand that binds us together. Well, you, you, That's uh, putting God first. Right. And scripture also talks about two, where two or more are gathered. There mm -hmm. am I in the midst of them. And just that, that feeling of we were there we just were reading, our own, reading our own on our own, but we were there and there was security in knowing that we were both having you know, spending time with God and in, in the Word. All right, number two. The second thing that Paul talks about and that we had going for us. Again, only two things going for us. The first was we, we truly had a sincere desire to put God first. But the second thing, which is also a really big deal that Paul hammers away at here, and that is stay married. Mm -hmm. That is really important because so often... Um, <clears throat> People throw around the D word a lot. Yeah, and if you leave a way out, if you if you if you have a way out, you're going to take it because right. eventually the marriage is going to be a big enough struggle that if if you have a way out, you're thinking, oh, I, I can always you know end it if it doesn't work. You're going to. 
Because mm -hmm. every marriage comes across some really tough times. Right. Now, I always said divorce, never. Murder, maybe. Yes. So, uh, well, but, but we you, had made the commitment uh, very, before we got married, yeah. in fact. We'd made the commitment that we were never going to threaten each other with divorce. So, we'd right. never, the D word, we, we, even, we said the D word. We didn't right. want to say divorce. We, we don't said, even, we've not even joking. Not even joking, not joking about joking it anymore. because we didn't think it was funny. Right. The, enough people's right. lives have been shattered by this. Right. That it's not funny. It's not funny for couples to joke right. about this. Mm -hmm. And it certainly, the, the, the threats of divorce and uh, all that is is manipulation. You're simply manipulating your spouse to try to get what you want by threatening to leave or threatening to divorce. Mm -hmm. No, just completely take that out of your vocabulary. There's something changes in you when you decide that no matter what, we are going to make this mm -hmm. work. Now, Scott, there's, there are times, though, that divorce is sometimes necessary. There, there are, sadly, there are some times when there is an unrepentant spouse who is living in sin, and as, as Christians, we cannot permit that sin into the family when there is ongoing adultery there are times when a spouse does have to put their foot down and I, I say when those times come it's very important that you get a lot of godly people speaking into your life and that you get some good godly counsel regarding this mm -hmm. now we got to bring this to a close but um, just you know I think a good way to end this is I, I'm just I'm thinking of a couple right now that both of us know and actually, the, the, this, I, could, I could tell this story time and again with several other couples. Um, they, they, when they first came to the bridge, their, their marriage was really in a mess. And there had been adultery and no real repentance that I, I, I mean, of course, the, the, he, he said he was sorry, but it, it's, it certainly didn't appear that way because he was still very defensive and he would deflect and say, well, yeah, but the reason I cheated was because of this. And, and then so there was no real forgiveness on his wife's side. And I think in a way I can understand because there was no real repentance, but that affair then came up in every argument that they had had. And they had gotten to the place where they, they just were not hardly speaking to each other. They would pass each other in the hallway and it would be awkward. It's like they'd have to turn sideways so they wouldn't touch each other when they would pass by each other. And it was just, just a really bad situation. They, they had told me that they stayed together for the sake of the kids. And I would hand it to them because I think that was a selfless move and that was one thing that they had that could go in their favor. People say, well, you should never stay together for the kids. And I say, no, you're wrong because the, that divorces shatter kids' lives. And, uh, and I think sometimes kids keeping a couple together can actually salvage the marriage. But they, they stayed together for the sake of the kids, decided they should probably find a church. And, um, but even, even when they first started coming to church, they were just picking at each other. Very few kind words ever. But... Um, when they started coming to church and they went to our marriage class and uh, got into marriage mentoring with another couple, there, these two areas, which I had challenged them on, these two areas were the only two areas that changed. Both of them individually decided they were going to start honoring God. But when you make that decision, you're going to honor God in your personal life, it can't help but work its way into your marriage. Because if you're not honoring God in your marriage, you're just not honoring God. They made that decision, both of them independently, and it changed the way they talked about each other and to each other. There came to the place of real repentance where this man really came to the end of himself and confessed his sin fully. And she granted forgiveness. And they began to rebuild. And uh, they had made the decision they were going to stay together for the rest of their lives, no matter what, and they were going to honor God. Well, now, this was a long time ago. Their kids are grown, and they will tell you that they are more in love today than ever before. I'm telling you, just these two principles. You decide that you're going to honor God in the way you treat each other in every way. It's not about a bad marriage. No, it's about a sinful you. No matter what she does, I'm going to honor God. And secondly, we are going to stay in this thing and we're going to make it work. You follow through on those two principles and you can see the kind of relationship that most of the world dreams of mm -hmm. and will be drawn to Christ because they see it in you. And Scott, I think of it as being a, it can be a little glimpse of heaven instead Absolutely. of a life sentence. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Linda. Mm -hmm. let's, let's bow our heads for prayer. And Father, I thank you so much for speaking to us in, in this moment, as we ask everybody now to consider how you want to speak to them personally. 
I pray in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would work. I pray for those singles who are watching right now and they're struggling because they, they recognize, man, they, they've not been putting you first in their single life. I pray that they would make that commitment right now that from here on out, they're turning away from whatever it is that's getting in the way. It could be porn for some or Tinder or, or just a lifestyle that's just kind of nonchalant and willing to just go out and have fun even though it's not honoring to you. I pray that all of our singles would fully embrace their singleness and say, I'm going to make the most of what God has given me in this time. And Father, I pray for our marrieds that in the same way that God would be first in every interaction, certainly in their personal, individual lives, but especially in their lives together, in every interaction, they'd be asking themselves that question, is Jesus pleased with how I'm talking and with what I'm doing? And may we be absolutely committed to following through on your calling for singles making the most of our single life, for marrieds making the most of our marriages and staying with it. And as God speaks to you, you determine in your heart and your mind right now, what are the changes I need to make? And in your heart, respond to him. Make that commitment, that promise to him to follow through on how you know that he is speaking. Thank you, God, for this chapter. And I thank you for applying it to our hearts and lives now. In Jesus' name, amen.